Imagine slipping below the waves to come face to face with a giant humpback whale. Well, that's the experience on offer here at Harvey Bay in this episode of Travel Oz. Hello, welcome. I'm Greg Granger. Ahead, face to face with a friendly humpback. Exploring remarkable Fraser Island. A ranch full of longhorn cattle. Feeding the leopard sharks. Racing the turtles. Zip lining through the rainforest. And swimming with platypus. Every morning at first light in whale season, the Quick Cat 2 is underway on Harvey Bay. Skippered by the pioneer of whale watching here, Brian Perry. Well, the Queensland Government has only just issued permits allowing people to free dive with the whales. We'll be tethered on a rope and hope that the whales will come up close to us. The conditions are perfect today. We've got clear blue skies, we've got flat seas. Now, let's pray for those whales being playful. Leading us into the water in this swim with whales will be Tracy Magyar. Well, Tracy, swimming with the whales would have to be a very, very special experience. How many times have you done it now? Twice. How yeah. was it? It was incredible, absolutely life changing. You don't understand how big they are until you get in the water and they're enormous. Very graceful too. It's surprising when you're in there, like, they'll go straight past you and you can see their eye and the eye is full on checking you out and that's really incredible. Tell me this, did you feel like you were making contact, you were communicating with that whale looking in that eye? In a way, yeah, you could tell they were really curious, really inquisitive, so they'd come right out and have a look and then they'd go away and then come back again. Because this is a brand new experience. You'll bring the whales in on uh, queue, you'll have them spry hopping for us. Will you standing out of the water? Well, last time I had my snorkelers swimming, yeah. so we had the whole boat entertained because we're all singing through our snorkels. So we'll, we'll try singing and see if that works. And then we'll try being silent and see if they rather that. So. <laughs> How are you feeling, girls? Hi, so so <laughs> Into the water we go tethered by what they call the angel line. Camera's ready. Come on, whales. Floating 10 metres off the back of the Quick Cat 2 gives the whales plenty of space to swim in close to us. And swim in they do. It's a real thrill as they come in ever so close. What's so good about Harvey Bay is that this is a natural stopover place for the whales. Somewhere they can hang out and play. What impresses me is how agile these giants are, cavorting and twisting with grace. They do seem as curious about us as we are of them. This whale comes in ever so close, so close it bumps our camera. For what seems like an eternity, the whales swim around us. This is whale watching heaven. And throughout this amazing experience, we're serenaded, their glorious whale song clearly audible. Out of the water, Tracy and I are clearly exhilarated. Tracy, we got so close. We did, we did. They were, you could see them, we could always touch them, but not quite, not quite there. So they come in close, they seem as inquisitive about you as you do about them. They do, we're these foreign creatures in the water, so they want to catch them out. We've got whales all around us. There must be 100 whales in the bay at the moment, 15,000 migrate up from Antarctica. Yep. And we've got uh, something like 100 in the bay here today. Yes, yes we do, about a third of that, about 15,000 will jump in. How good is, how good is this? Look at that, look, there's one there and there's another one here. Look at this, this guy's going to come right up in front of us. Look, look, look. Oh, okay. We're now to Fraser Island, just off the southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef. What a remarkable place this is. There's surf, sandy beaches, rainforest and lakes. Let's go explore. Our first encounter is with a man who's literally dropped out of the sky. Jerry Kelp owns his own airline, Air Fraser. Hey, Greg. How you going, mate? Good to see you. Bit windy? 
It is a bit breezy, but that's all right. That's going to help us out. Welcome to the beach, beautiful World Heritage Fraser Island International Airport. Get your passports ready. We're going flying. OK? <laughs> right on. Jerry's offered to fly us over Fraser Island to take in its scenic wonders. Fraser Island, mate. It's the largest sand island in the world. It's approximately 120 kilometres long by about 20 kilometres wide at the widest spot. The only place in the world where rainforest actually grows in a real sand environment. Fantastic. Also, it's got the most perch lakes uh, in the world. Have a look out the window there as we bank around and you'll see uh, the, the beautiful white sand of the lake uh, there and the, uh, the crystal clear water. It looks really aqua. A lot of turpentine trees down there and uh, some of those trees are over 40 metres high and that's over 120 feet in the old scale. My father started flying over here in the mid-70s and uh, I took over in 92 and now my younger son, our uh, third generation beach pilot, he flies for us as well now. Uh, there's just no better place to be and, uh, and to work, you know, it's, there's nothing else we want to do, you know, it's just, this is it, you know. And once you've been on Fraser Island for a, for a certain time, um, you know, the, the, the sand gets into your blood and you just can't get away from it, you know, you're hooked, you know, that's it. Back on terra firma, I meet another of Fraser Island's resident talents, photographer Peter Meyer. Hey, g'day. Caught you mid-click. Great, how are you, mate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect conditions out here on Lake Mackenzie. Beautiful light. Yeah, you got lucky, yeah, uh, you got lucky. It's not always like this. Uh... <laughs> Clear skies. <laughs> Peter, you've created some magnificent images in all sorts of light. Yep. You've put in the time, you've made the effort, you've captured these just stunning images oh you have a good eye uh, yeah it takes uh, it takes a long time uh, i guess i'm i'm fussy and uh, sometimes you've got to go back many many times and the phrase is not easy to get around you know you've got to go on four wheel drive tracks that sometimes are pretty difficult so it can be demanding sometimes but uh, yeah it's worth it sometimes as well but also it's the variety uh, you've got within half an hour of each other you can have freshwater lakes like mackenzie and then you've got giant sand dunes, you've got rainforest, you've got the beach that stretches forever. You, you have a lot of variety, that, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. So Lake Mackenzie this morning on this glorious day, what are you happy to capture here? I don't know, I was looking at reflections, I like the reeds, I like the uh, reflection of the paperbacks as well, the, the Malalukas, you know, that's always nice. And then even just ripples, I like patterns, I'm obsessed with patterns and things like that as well. Rainforest covers much of Fraser Island with Peter leading me on a walk through its lush vegetation. So uh, this is a place called Pyle Valley. It's, uh, it's part of the rainforest or closed forest on Fraser Island. Tall, tall trees. Yeah, serious trees. Like they get up to 50 metres high and four metres wide. They believe it's about 250 metres for every metre wide. So you're looking at a thousand year old trees on the island. So something very special for this rainforest to be actually growing into the sand. In this... sand, it's very unusual, yeah, yeah. It's the only sand island in the world to have rainforest growing on it, so uh, it's pretty unique. Um, and certainly the source of some beautiful images for you in your photography. Yeah, I, uh, I do like shooting this. I find rainforest very difficult. It's usually really messy, except this, this area here is sort of, it's got some great symmetry with these great big trees and beautiful green um, fern fronds. It's, I like it a lot. The, the colours are just fantastic. Peter, we've got movement in the tree there. Yeah. Python? Yeah, yeah, carpet python, yeah. So these carpet pythons, how big would they grow? Uh, they go up to about four metres, 12 feet long. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can get pretty big. And endemic? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We have uh, about 20 species of snake, and that's the most common one you see. Um, look, 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 he's poking his head around the corner of here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use their tongue to smell, so their tongue is forked, right? So depending on which direction the scent comes from, it lands on one side of the tongue. Yeah. On, on, and they're very accurate with uh, finding prey like that. Yeah. So quite a treat to see him. And any danger with those, those bigger ones? No, 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 no. They're, they're really placid. Uh, they're very placid, actually. Another of the lakes is Lake Wadi, created when a giant sand dune blocked a creek. It's a bit of a walk, but uh, it's worth it, trust me. Uh, wait till you see it. It's like Wobby? Like Wobby, mate. It's the, it's wow. the place. Uh, Look at this. Yeah, it's worth the walk. Uh, <laughs> and Peter. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So much sand. Oh, more sand than you can eat, trust me. Uh, it's always everywhere in your pockets. It'll always be in your shoes from now on, trust me. Uh, How much sand? on the sandy Fraser Island? Uh, well, it's a pretty big place. It's the largest sand island in the world. Sand goes as far as 100 metres below sea level and 240 metres above sea level, so. And this sand is moving, this particular dune we're on now. Yeah, this is called Hammerstone Sand Blow. Yeah. It's a fantastic sand dune, and it's actually moved across the path of a freshwater creek and dammed it up and created a lake. Then that's what Lake Wobby is, so it's, it's a fantastic place. Well, Lake Wobby, after this long walk, sounds like a very inviting place to have a swim. You'd be mad not to, mate. All right, Peter, come on. Oh, come, come on, on let's, okay. do it. let's do it. Oh, 
<laughs> Our final Fraser experience is on the Fraser Freeway, a beach where there are actual speed limits and road rules, plenty of obstacles. Well, we had that fantastic experience landing on the aircraft on this beach. Now you're taking us for a wonderful drive. That's it, mate. That's one of the must-dos is uh, when you come here. Is this beach is 123 kilometres long, you know. In fact, what I love about driving on this beach is when you see the reflection of the clouds in the wet sand and it's like you're driving on the sky. Yeah, it's a fantastic experience. And then you see a lot more bird life, you've got a better chance of seeing marine life. We see whales in wintertime just on the other side of the waves, just jumping like crazy. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's a proper highway. The speed limit here is 80 kilometres an hour and we have police. They have radar guns, breath testing, the whole lot. And there's water aplenty. You've got the surf, you've got the waves coming yeah, in yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. You think, oh, it's so big, it's no problem. You just plant the foot. But no, you really have to pay attention when you're on the beach. Because it's all the same colour, you can't see variations in the sand. And so you really have to pay attention where the drop-offs are and all of that. Yeah, Eli Creek, yeah, you don't want to drive through there too quickly. <laughs> Peter, you've given us a, an absolute hoot of a journey and experience here on Fraser Island. Thanks so very much. Hey, no worries, mate. Anytime. Yeah, hey, anytime. Good you come back anytime. Keep your hands on the wheel. Yeah, yeah, I promise. Yeah, yeah. Well, now to Townsville, the Reef HQ Aquarium, which is the education centre for the Great Barrier Reef. It's the world's largest living coral reef aquarium. An opportunity to experience the Great Barrier Reef without getting wet. In the touch pond, Zoologist Julie Spencer interacts with the starfish and stingray. This is a little blue spot lagoon ray that we have here. And we always teach people, if you do go out walking on the reef, to do the stingray shuffle. So instead of doing big stomps and running around, we encourage you to just shuffle your feet like this. And that way the, the stingrays, if they are hidden underneath the sand, they can sense you and swim away. So apart from the stingray, you've got quite a few fish here. You've got the starfish, of course. What have you got here? So this one here is called the rhinoceros starfish. And it's called this because you can see the very prominent points that it has on the top of its body. You can see this one here it has little tube feet that you can see coming out of the rows on its arms. And that's what they use for locomotion. Julie puts the starfish under a powerful microscope. This technology is fantastic because it allows us to get an up-close view of these creatures. So here we can see the tube feet on the ends of the arms of the sea star. Can you see that tiny little red dot on the screen? Mm. Now that's a light sensitive organ. So these sea stars can tell if it's light or dark. So on the underneath we can see the grooves where they keep their little tube feet and right in the centre is where the sea star's mouth is. So at the moment it's closed its mouth, but if it was to feed it would push its stomach out of the mouth to digest its food externally. In the aquarium's hospital we meet Izzy, a giant green turtle who's been hit by a boat and nipped by a croc. In charge of her recovery is aquarist Crystal Huff, who feeds and scrubs her every day. Now she looks like she belongs out there on the Great Barrier Reef, why here? Well, she's here because she's had a few problems out there. So she had what we call floating syndrome, which means that the animal can't dive down, which is where their food is, and so they slowly, uh, <laughs> they slowly lose weight. Here in rehabilitation, we actually feed them squid because it's very high in protein. So it helps recover them more quickly if they're able to have a nice fatty meal like squid, as opposed to eating tons and tons of seagrass a day. Now, the other thing you do here that she derives enormous pleasure from is actually scrub her back. <laughs> we do, so it is a bit of a spa treatment here for them while they're here, but they have nerves running through this shell and they can feel everything that touches oh, them on the shell. Really? And you can see her reacting there. So out in the wild, they usually scratch themselves on rocks and coral to help keep their shell clean of parasites. So we come along with the scrubbing brush every few days and make sure that she stays nice and clean. And they also really enjoy it. And they're a bit like a dog. When you get them in the right spot, they'll do a little dance just underneath oh. the scrubbing brush for you. And a bit of fun for us, I might say. I was going to say, it looks like a lot of fun for you. <laughs> Upstairs, above the biggest tank, Crystal introduces me to two docile leopard sharks, mother and juvenile. This is the Leo, the father. And we've got a young guy here as well, his name is Mo. So leopard sharks, of course, are found all over the Great Barrier Reef. They are. These guys are considered threatened worldwide. And we're very proud of the fact that we're able to breed these guys here at Reef HQ Aquarium, which helps to sort of take the pressure off wild sharks because we can pass our juveniles onto other aquariums around Australia and around the world and they don't have to take one out of the wild then. And overseas they're actually known as zebra sharks because when they're first born they're actually black and white stripes. Um, it takes them about a year and a half to change from stripes into spots 
And each one has an individual spot pattern, just like our own fingerprints, so we can actually tell them apart. Now look at this. Look at that. She's not phased by that at all. Well, that's one of the benefits of uh, being able to breed these guys in captivity is that they're used to us handling them so that we can do health checks on them and make sure that they're OK throughout their life. Just south of Townsville at the Billabong Sanctuary, we've arrived in time to see the turtles massing. Well, after we've, uh, we've fed out our fish skins, we're actually going to select a couple of fast-looking turtles and we're going to race them back into the Billabong. Ranger Jeremy Herberg not only feeds the turtle, he races them daily. Believe it or not, the louder you cheer, the faster they're going to go. Racing, turtles, Margot and Clinton racing shell to shell. Clinton's a bit of a slow starter, Margot's taking the lead and Margot powers on a clear winner in today's Billabong Turtle Cup. Next, the dingoes, a wild Aussie icon. Ranger Jules shows them off to the public every day. They are in fact not a dog. They are a separate species, Canis dingo. Then introduces me to one of her favourites. What a beautiful <laughs> specimen. And who have we got here? Um, this is Kalari, so she's one of our female dingoes. She's about three years old now, um, and she's what they call the alpine type of dingo, and you can see with this white, quite thick fur here. So you're a big fan. I hear you speaking very positively about these creatures. You wouldn't speak uh, bad about them at all, would you? I mean, I'm a realist, so they are a predator. They are a wild predator, and I think we need to acknowledge that and be OK with that. But a lot of what dingoes get blamed for and a lot of bad rap that they get isn't justified, and that's really what I'm about, is correcting that information to make sure that people truly understand dingoes and appreciate them for the animal that they are. Our final billabong experience is with the crocs. First, a baby croc. Ranger Jeremy warns that even at this size, we should be careful. Amazing to think that this fella could grow up to four or even five metres. If it's a male, yeah, absolutely. The females won't grow that big, but they'll get to maybe two and a half, three metres. This is just a superb creature. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one that um, a lot of people don't really get to appreciate. So okay. visitors can, can hold them just like you are now. It's a great opportunity for them to see a crocodile safely. You know, even at this size, he's capable of doing you a, a very serious injury. Jeremy then goes into feeding mode. And you can just hear that jaw pressure. But the thing with crocodiles is that uh, they're opportunistic and they'll usually go for the closest and the easiest option. So it's a matter of keeping him focused on the food item rather than focused on me. You know, there's a, there's a lot going on in my mind throughout the entire show. I've got to be watching the crocodile, I've got to be aware of what I'm doing and also be able to deliver a, a coherent presentation to the audience. He's capable of taking down any prey item that lives in this part of the world. I, I do occasionally still get nervous under certain circumstances. You break through those barriers during your training. You can't go and work with crocodiles if you're afraid. You've got to be able to trust your reactions. You've got to be in the moment and you can't do that if you're scared. So a four and a half metre croc is not an easy animal to escape from. So the trick is not getting in those jaws in the first place. Well, now to Charters Towers, just inland of Townsville, in central Queensland, for Australia's biggest herd of Texas Longhorn cattle. We know we're in for a treat when the property owner, Mick Bethel, walks out to greet us with a friendly <laughs> kangaroo as an escort. Mick, how are you going? G'day, and uh, this would be little... Uh, this is Penny. Yeah, this is Penny, a little Eaton Grey. And what's the history here? Well, like a lot of kangaroos in this country, our uh, mother got run over on the road and Penny would have been the same, but we decided to, you know, we brought her home and read her and, you know, she'd become a part of the family. She'd live in the house if we, if, if we let her. OK, so you've got a lot to show us today, the Texas Longhorns, your saddlery. Yeah, we've got the Texas Longhorns, we've got the buffalo, we've got the bison, we've got the saddle, so there's a plenty to see, Greg, there's plenty to see. <laughs> All right, let's get going. No worries. Come on, Penny. Come on. Today, Mick is turning on a country breakfast for guests. A scrumptious open fire baked damper to start the day. This is all a warm up to Mick's great love. Saddling up two enormous Percheron draft horses that will pull a coach out to see his herd of Texas Longhorn cattle. Mick's very proud of his hand built wagon, using it to pull guests out to his Longhorns. So the key question why Texas Longhorns? Well, we, you know, I grew up in a cattle station and spent all my life in the bush and was just always fascinated with things from the old Wild West and thought, you know, it doesn't get any more cowboy or western than Texas Longhorns, so 
We've got the biggest herd of full blood long ones in Australia. What are you doing? Are they all just show cattle or will you sell them off to other farms? Uh, we, we sell young steers, we sell young bulls, young heifers, and we try to keep a, a good selection of cattle so people can get to see different colours of the longhorn, different horn lengths, different horn shapes. And what about this beast? This is JR sporting the world's biggest, widest horns. In 2013, he was certified by the Guinness World Records organisation of the longest horns, measured tip to tip of any beast in the world. So they were nine feet one when he got into the Guinness World Record book. So wow. We measured him just a few months ago and he was nine feet six from tip to tip, so his horns are still growing. And you, you don't really appreciate how long they are until you get up really, really close to him. So people not only do your wagon ride, they get out of the wagon, they can walk amongst these cattle, and you don't think there's any danger? No, no, no. We, we try to keep them just a little bit nervous, so to make sure they don't get too close. But, you know, we've never had anyone get hurt, put it that way. As you say, we've got the water buffalo so close. Look at this fellow here. Now, they can be quite frisky, can't they? Yeah, and we've got several different types of water buffalo. We've got Indian, Indonesian, and you can see that they're eyeing us off here. I think if we don't move too quick, we are probably pretty safe. Another experience on mixed property, a glimpse at the workshop where he creates high quality saddles. Welcome to Bethel Saddle Rex. Okay. Horse riders from all over the world, especially the USA, commissioned Mick to create saddles to their personal specifications. All handmade, uh, the designs are hand done, uh, all the parts are hand fitted, individually hand fitted to the saddle. And it's a work of art. You know, I've been building for 25 years now, and you'll see saddles were made 25 years ago come back to be repaired, and they're almost as good as they were when they were new, so that's when they really pay off. One final experience on Mick's property. Wow. Now, they're massive horns, Mick. Yeah. You're not worried she's going to swing the head around? Uh, we kind of read the animals. You sort of know what you can do and what you can't do. That's amazing. You're able to stroke this beast on the head without any danger, without any fear at all. Whoa. That's, yeah, that's right. I mean, you can see the, the sheer length of his horns and also the size and the thickness of them at the base. They're big horns and they're a lot longer than what my arms are. He's a quiet animal. Uh, you know, I trust him. And not, not only do you trust him, he trusts you, and this is a trust that's been built up since he was a little calf. Yeah, that's right. He knows I'm not going to do anything at all that's going to hurt him. And uh, I guess I trust him and he trusts me back. Travel the creeks around Yungala in land of Mackay in central Queensland are teeming with platypus. And one local operator has had a brilliant idea. Let's swim with them, she says. And so, off we go. Stand on the banks of a creek around Yungula and you'll see platypus after platypus surface briefly before duck diving back to the bottom. They're a creature that fascinates Luana Royale, so much so that she runs her professional diving trips out to see them. Yeah, I've been diving since I was 14 years of age. I just love it. It's a whole new world. But this is my favourite dive. It's peaceful, it's calm, unusual. OK, if we're lucky, we're going to see platypus. That's yes. the intention. That's the intention. But there's other creatures down here as well. There certainly is. Um, there's four types of freshwater turtles that I've actually identified. And we've got lots and lots of fish. Sounds like a great adventure. Let's go see, eh? Definitely. Armed with a GoPro, I'm hoping to film something special. Swimming in a rainforest creek. What a surreal experience. In amongst the tree roots we swim, encountering a world few divers ever experience. When we look around at the scenery here, very different from an ocean dive, we're in a river, we're seeing the roots of trees, we're seeing all manner of vegetation on the bottom. Very pretty, very pretty. It is very pretty. Oh, it's just magnificent. We're seeing fish. Well, now, what sort of fish have we got here? That one just over there, That's see the bluish haze to it? That's a sooty grunter. Then we've got the golden perch. They're the ones that have got that nice gold sides on them. But look, that everything you see here, there's something exciting about it. Now, catfish, if you're able to seek out this catfish, get up relatively close. Pretty close. She just looks like a catfish. And then all of a sudden, you see her back half. It's flat like an eel, it's shaped like an eel, but it still belongs to that fish. Glorious sunlight in this water, we're seeing turtles. Yes, four breeds we've spotted so far. We've also got plain turtles, um, saw-shelled ones, quite a few. Sure enough, there's fish plenty here. But the big elusive star is the platypus. We're fortunate enough to catch sight of one of them. Now, we're lucky enough to see platypus in all manner of behaviours here. 
a lot of surfacing taking place here. Well, the reason that they're surfacing is because they've stuffed their cheeks full of food and the cheeks are actually down behind their eyes. That's when they're crunching their food and they just grind their food up, swallow it and then back down again for another dive. About average 70 dives an hour and 1,600 a night. So they're pretty tuckered out by the first thing in the morning. So they're a very shy, very reclusive creature and we're very lucky, we're very fortunate to be able to see them behaving like this. Oh yes, definitely very lucky to see them behaving. You're definitely very lucky if you see them full stop, whether you're on top of the water or under the water. One other experience close to the Platypus Creeks is with a family who've built a home into the hillside in the rainforest. It's here, surrounded by a colony of flying foxes, that Dave Lowe and his family invite guests to take a flying fox ride through the treetops. So Dave, you've chosen to live here, right here in the middle of this rainforest. Yep, yep, beautiful part of the world. I came here, bought this property in 89 and I've never wanted to go anywhere else. So there is big colonies of flying foxes here. Uh, it varies throughout the year. In summer we can have as many as half a million sometimes. Like if there's been a cyclone along the coast, they'll all move inland and come here. At the moment there's probably only 1,500, maybe 2,000 at the most. Whoa! <laughs> this is quite something, because all around me up here, colonies of flying fox hanging there, squawking, making a loud noise, all the same time as me having a great thrill. So this is quite some ride. It's meant as a ride in which you can enjoy the rainforest, enjoy the plantation, enjoy the flying foxes. It was never intended to be really fast, although you can go pretty quickly on the first one if you want. It was, it was set up with the intention of going slow so you can stop and look around. And certainly there's plenty to see. We're up at quite an elevation too. What, what sort of height? The highest point where we first crossed the creek is 25 metres and then it gets lower down towards the finish. So you think you found the, 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 the perfect home, have you? And the oh, perfect... yeah. I don't want to go anywhere else. <laughs> and the perfect job. <laughs> well, how good was that swim with the whales? So good, we're going out again while watching here on Harvey Bay. Once again, we're surrounded by humpbacks, displaying a range of behaviours ever so close to our boat. Skipper Lloyd Burgess has been filming the humpbacks on his daily whale watching trips, capturing the most spectacular of action. Breach after breach. It's a measure of how intelligent these creatures are. They don't need to breach to catch a meal, they're just doing it for sheer pleasure. And watch this one actually rotating as it launches itself into the air. And the other wonderful trick is to get the GoPro going, put it on a pole, immerse it and get some wonderful underwater shots. Here we go, here he comes. And finally, my favourite. The slow-mo effect allows us to watch the water gush out of this whale's mouth. Well, it truly has been an exhilarating experience, a magic experience, swimming with the humpbacks here on Harvey Bay. I'm Greg Granger. Happy travels.